I know this is late, and I, I'm a week late. Yeah, I'm a week late. Um, reviewing this and trying to um, you know talk about this film. I I was gonna record a video for this, but I got busy with I got busy with a lot of like editing for the big season two premiere video of Resident Evil Six. I have to work on the next one uh, soon. But, um, hey, salutations, everyone. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> salutations, everyone. I'm Nirvi Koshi, and welcome to another movie review, which has been quite a while since my last one. I've seen a bunch of movies. I might as well get to the big one. That's the title of this video. And then the rest, I guess. Or we can go with the quicker ones. So my point would be better. But we'll go with the big one that came out uh, on Friday. And... Like Friday when? Like Fr I think it was Friday in February 6th, I think. I don't know. I, can't be, I could be wrong. I forgot the dates already. But we are here to talk about Lisa Frankenstein. Or as running joke or... No, not a running joke. It's more like we're serious about it. <laughs> I mean, is it a running gag? Running joke? I don't know. What you would call that you would constantly say about it uh well i guess constantly praise it is what i'm trying to say this we'd be calling it uh peak cinema we're calling after seeing the trailer for lisa frankenstein we've been calling it peak <laughs> we're like this is peak cinema right here a true cinephile should watch this movie uh <laughs> uh garnering the title uh, of the video, <laughs> Lisa Peekenstein, <laughs> that um, me and uh, Mia have uh, kind of coined that phrase, basically. So, um, as you already probably know this already, uh, reviews for this movie haven't been great from the critics' point of view. Audiences seem to like it. Uh, a few like um, movie critics I've watched online, one particular that I've seen that praised the movie and said that this would totally garner a uh, <clears throat> a, a cult following over the years uh, was Chris Stuckman. He talked about this movie, said how good it was. I liked it too. I think my opinions are going to be the same as his. I guess, but me, uh, I went into this movie scared, but, um, uh, <laughs> the thing is there's a funny story about this that I liked before going to see the movie. So the movie's not getting the biggest, like, um, attraction in the theater that I, that I go to. Uh, it's show times are limited compared to the uh, other movies that came out like Argyle, um, Mean Girls, and a bunch of other films that came out that are still in theaters that people are watching that got more theaters than Lisa Frankenstein does. And uh, so I had to wait for about I say about two and a half hours uh, to go see my showing of it. And I went to the theater, did my ticket. Then I went to a store nearby to go check out some stuff before going to see the movie. In this store, it's called The Cave. It's basically my uh dimp it's it's a replacement for dimple records so to speak so far uh because dimple sadly my store that store i always loved that store because it was a great place 
to collect uh, old video games, old movies without price gouging, which I was glad that they didn't price gouge a lot of the stuff that you would probably see on Amazon or online where people would just jack up the price of a game that is old. And I always loved that store because their prices were reasonable. Um, the cave, not so much. A lot of the games are expensive, big, even though they're older. I saw a, one game that I was like thinking, oh, I should get that. But then I realized it wasn't backwards compatible, so kind of sucks. <laughs> Uh, I, next to the game, which was an alpha protocol, was a UMD physical copy of Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> this will make sense soon, I promise. Uh, <laughs> I was like, oh wow, so someone sold their copy of a PSP version of Napoleon Dynamite. And I started um, thinking of the one scene with Napoleon and Debbie playing tetherball uh, at the end of the film. And a song that I played, and I, I always love this song because I know something about that song makes me feel teary eyed. I don't know why when it's played at the end of that film. Maybe it's because everything went great for everyone except for the preppy school kids. <laughs> um, when he and her are like playing tenor ball, a song comes on. It's called The Promise by When in Rome. And I never knew the name of the song until I rewatched the movie probably last year or during the pandemic. I was like, you know what? I need to look up that song because that song, I love that song. Because that movie has a great soundtrack. A lot of songs that were introduced to me because of that movie, you know, Can Heat by Jamiroquai, uh, Time After Time by Sidney Lauper, uh, a good soundtrack, <laughs> really good soundtrack. Um, and I started thinking about The Promise. I was like, man, I like that I like that song, and I like that ending. <laughs> and when I remember the movie. And went back to the theater. I still had a, a, a time remaining. I didn't go out to buy snacks in the theater. I had brought my own. So I just sat there for a while, washing my glasses, because they were a bit dirty. Um, washing my hands as well because I've been touching a bunch of stuff around the outside in the public area including the store and was sitting there time started to go and watch the movie I went to the theater got my seat and after the trailers played the movie starts and what song plays at the beginning of Lisa well there's a there's a short there's like the opening title credits first before they got to the title but when the title of the movie comes like a pan shot of the graveyard you see the title of the movie what song plays the promise <laughs> plays <laughs> and I was like in the theater like what? <laughs> shocked. I was shocked. I was like surprised. <laughs> I was sitting there just absolutely bewildered. <laughs> Flabbergasted, if you will. Um, <laughs> when I uh when I, when I heard the song. And it's so funny that I started thinking about that song again because of Napoleon Dynamite and sure enough I was like already like 10 out of 10 movie <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's not gonna be a perfect 10 out of 10 it's not it's not it, I know that's kind of like this is gonna be already a praised movie already the movie's huge praise enough 
Uh, but, you know, I have a few complaints here and there. It's not, 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 nothing big that I have about the movie, but I still enjoyed it. Um, I was, like, so worried that I was like, oh, please let this movie be good. Please let this movie be good. And, sure enough, I like the movie. If you're going in expecting, oh, it's a laugh out loud comedy, which it's not. It's not a laugh out loud comedy. This is straight up a comedy. It will give you a few chuckles here and there, a few big laughs here and there, but not like per second, per minute of a joke. It's not that kind of movie where they would just flash you a bunch of jokes, see which sticks, or a, or it's not a movie where they make a joke and then they pause for laughter for the audience. It's not those kind of movies that do that. Believe me, we had too much of these movies already uh, that I don't like that do that. Um, this is a movie, I would say, that it's been a long time since a movie done th has done this to me. This is a movie that will leave you smiling all the way through, in my opinion. I smiled all the way through in this movie. I had a few smiles. Like, <laughs> like it's not a permanent smile where I'm just looking like a crazy person. It's more like there'd be like long stretches of scenes where I would smile and I'll stop. And there'd be another part where I like it and it's like I, I laugh a bit and I smile. It's those movies. It's a movie that makes you happy, makes you smile, makes you like it. <laughs> it's, it is a, I will say this, it is a typical like romance kind of horror film uh, that you have probably seen before. But what makes it better is this movie is like truly and this word is this phrase this way of saying it has been used bluntly a lot in movies i say this is a genuine love letter to the 80s and i mean that in the biggest way possible because this is a truly this movie feels like an 80s movie that was lost to time no one's heard of it, never even got a theatrical release, and all of a sudden it just pops out of nowhere like, oh, we discovered this old 80s movie that has never seen the light of day. We should probably uh, show it to the public. And that's what it felt like. It's, I would say this movie does feel very much like an 80s movie. I don't know if it's Diablo Cody's writing or... Zelda Williams' direction, which probably is both of them. Both of them probably had a hand on what they wanted for this film. And I think with Zelda Williams, for this being her directional debut, this movie, I say she's already doing amazing. She's already doing fantastic. This is like her first film she's ever directed. And she's already doing a good job. I heard that she is delving more into the horror genre in future movies she's going to make. And I don't know what Zelda Williams' style of directing is going to be. But I already like the style she did went with with this movie. It felt very much like an 80s movie and i mean that a lot the way it's shot the way it's uh, handled the, the, there's a lot of weird shots in this movie that i like like i think my favorite shot that made me laugh so hard is an and i'm not spoiling this is an axe throwing scene where one of the people get killed because <laughs> lisa lured this guy in took his hand so uh, the undead like uh, creature that uh, was resurrected she was helping him uh, get more of his limbs back like hand ear and also another part that 
Sure as hell surprised me they were going to that direction. <laughs> I was like, wow, we, we're really doing this. <laughs> I was like, damn. Uh, and <laughs> there was a shot where this, where um, the creature played by Cole Sprouse, he threw the axe and it's in this weird cheap kind of like look of like it was just basically axe cam like you just see the axe like like flying slowly towards the direction of the person that was gonna get killed and I just laughed so hard because I'm like that was a that was like a cheap effect but at that point it's like I think it was cheap on purpose <laughs> which is saying something being cheap on purpose to look like an old like uh effect old practical effect of how like well how do we show this axe being thrown at this person uh at this pace usually people would just do the shot where uh they move the camera really fast and then with clever editing techniques just s cut a part of the movie where it was very fast to make it look like it's one shot and then cut to the other scene where the axe is in someone's back like that's what usually people would do for the movie but no they were like no show the axe fl flying towards this person's direction very slowly then show him getting killed <laughs> with the axe <laughs> I love it because that's something I would definitely see in an older movie that would have done that and I say they mastered that perfectly I thought that was a good shot of the movie it also took me a long time to realize they were in the 80s there was no I don't know if I'm wrong or not there was no like title card there was no card that said like Oh, uh, 1989 or, um, March 40, March 30 something to like 19 something, whatever. Like, you know, that kind of thing that they would do to establish, hey, this is the year this takes place. No, it didn't do that. It just was like, this is the movie. Uh, let's see how long it will take you to realize you're in the 80s. <laughs> and, it took me a long while <laughs> from cassette player to a stereo system, uh, corded phones, a phone that is a, te a, t a sh telephone shoe, <laughs> a telephone shoe, which I was like, what? <laughs> It took me a while. The small TVs and everything, uh, the the um, the style, the clothing style that you see people wear in the movie. I was like, especially when I just was like wondering, wait, because there was one part I forgot that Lisa's stepmom was a nurse, and then you see her in the costume, the outfit. I was like, okay, why does this woman look like Nurse Ratchet from? one who flew over the cuckoo's nest what the fuck is going on here and i was realizing oh yeah she's a nurse i don't i didn't know that nurses still wore that kind of clothing and then you realize oh right <laughs> we're in <laughs> this time period and you just start to think oh we're in the 80s but i didn't it didn't dong on my head immediately when Lisa straight up said it's 1899, I was, I mean, it's 1989. I was like, Bleh. 1989. It's 1989. Have I been saying 1889 this whole time? Fuck. <laughs> 1989. 1989. My brain just fucking failed me. Uh, <laughs> and when Lisa said that, I was like, I started piecing everything together that I saw in the movie, and I was like, no, oh, we really are in the 80s, because I had to look back at my brain 
and was like, yeah, no one used a cell phone or anything. Lisa has those old black and white universal horror movie creatures in the background on her wall. I was like, yeah, this is, yeah, this is the 80s. I just realized that. And that's the beauty of this movie. It's a movie that feels like this could have definitely been made in the 80s, especially with the beginning of the movie, to me, felt like a Tim Burton film, kind of akin to a Edward Scissorhands, where there's one, or Beetlejuice, where there's one lone character, either, you know, a girl, boy, mainly kind of a girl, like Lydia Dietz or anyone, uh, played by Winona Ryder. Funny enough, those two movies both star her. <laughs> um, Beetleju Beetlejuice and, uh, and uh, Edward Scissorhands. And seeing the, like, there, there's lone characters that have that golf look and style of them, and they don't fit in with the whole suburban crowd of people that just think, oh, they're weird. <laughs> it felt very Tim Burton esque to me with how the beginning started, seeing her being a loner, not talking much. And also these people in this suburban place. I think there was a, there was another golf girl in there, but she was also a bitch too, which was fucked up. But everyone also treated her weird too, like oh she's weird also. <laughs> and they <laughs> and you see like how it's like when you see these people talk like these these extroverted crowd of people. You like cheerleaders or preps or anything. You just see them, uh, the way they talk, the way they act, how snooty, asshole-ish like they are. Um, it feels like something that Tim Burton would do because when Tim Burton portrays characters in a suburban environment and show how awful they are <laughs> and how they're quick to turn to people and say oh, who cares about them they were weird anyway <laughs> because they would do one thing and they're like nah they're awful <laughs> burn them <laughs> arrest them for being different <laughs> kind of thing uh the misunderstood like characters basically yeah, especially how bitchy they are because they were like, oh, her mom died by an axe murder. I bet she loved the attention when her mom died. I was like, Jesus, the hell's wrong with you people? <laughs> well, especially like the sister, her stepsister in the movie, which, funny enough, this was her first movie. I didn't know that. And she was also, I didn't know she was Filipino also. And I was like, very shocked. I was like, oh, wow, pretty cool. Uh, I like that. <laughs> Yeah, she was pretty good. I liked her. Lisa Sobranzo, I think her name was. She was she was pretty good in the movie, too. I hope she does more films in the future. She seems pretty great. Uh, she, <laughs> she looked like... She had, like, a mixed bag for me because there were general times where it feels like, yeah, she's on Lisa's side uh, and times that she's not. It's usually like when she sees someone uh, being awful to her, she's like, back off, fuck you. How dare you do this to her? She deserves better. But then when it comes to her selfish needs uh, that would benefit her more, uh, she's not a good person to Lisa. Because Lisa has a crush on a guy that she likes because she tells her sister this, and then what happens? She she tries to steal her man <laughs> that she had a crush on. I thought the guy was good enough too because he just out of the fucking nowhere just goes in and be like, hey, it wasn't gonna work out. I was like, dude, why were you leading her on then? Good God, that was awful. I was like, Jesus, he looked nice. He seemed nice to her. He also liked her poems that she sent in a school paper 
and then all of a sudden the dude's like whatever as much as you seem like a cool person and we kind of share common interest i don't think i find you uh girlfriend material just bruh <laughs> it was like no don't kill him and then all of a sudden the bullshit he says and then the fucking creature comes in like all right <laughs> i kill him <laughs> just like bam <laughs> and I'm just thinking, oh yeah, he, <laughs> that's how he died. Oh, <laughs> uh, what time? What timer is on it now? <laughs> Woof. At this part of the video, put the put the uh, put the clip on. Put the clip as I'm laughing. Put the audio clip of what I'm thinking, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> of the scene <laughs> I can't I can't do it justice <laughs> uh, um when and yeah everyone seems cruel to her even the mother's awful because she, she doesn't understand she seems like a fucking awful person and the dad he's just emotionally gone <laughs> he's like like he doesn't understand what's happening he just seems like trapped in his own little world he's just like yeah whatever and i'm just like man this guy reminds me of mike wheeler's dad from stranger things because it is <laughs> it is his dad from stranger things i was like Jeez, I guess this dude is only good for one type of role. Just become the most oblivious dad in the 80s. <laughs> That's all he's known for, I guess. Because <laughs> that's what it is. I was like, is this, this is like Mike Wheeler's dad. It's like, oh, wait, it is his dad. <laughs> that man is probably robbing Hollywood blind, saying like, I have one role I can do, <laughs> and it's Oblivious Father. <laughs> he just has to do a few lines, gets his paycheck, and then he's gone. <laughs> out the door. <laughs> I did my part. I'm out. I'm going to film the final season of Stranger Things now. <laughs> I do it I did like how like it the movie it did feel great. I did like that. Especially Lisa. I did like the I like my favorite thing is that you start to see an arc of these characters in this film. Like three characters that I paid attention more of that you see an arc of them. Lisa's arc of like going from being a goth and then becoming more uh, extroverted and being more out there and having living her best life basically. She just feels more alive than ever when meeting with the dead guy that she that spontaneously resurrected from a mysterious green lightning. <laughs> Thing. And, <laughs> which is like huh that's odd <laughs> just random green lighting that resurrected this dude and then boom <laughs> he's back from the dead and seeing also like her sister slowly becoming more kind of introverted in a way and breaking down and crying and depressed Thinking of the thought of like, oh god, what if I'm gonna be like Lisa and having a dead mom too? And she's like paranoid and shit. <laughs> and I, and also the creature in the movie, which is played by Cole Sprouse, I say he does a great job. I do like, he does like i think yeah mia said this he does invoke like a younger johnny depp back in the day when johnny played 
when Johnny Depp was young and he played roles like this where he's like the very timid and very shy kind of outcast character like when he's Edward Scissorhands or when he was Ichabod Crane in Sleepy Hollow like he Cole did a Cole Sprouse did a great job playing the creature which he doesn't have a name in the movie he's just called the creature in the credits and he and you see like the silent like acting he does kind of I can do you know Charlie Chaplin or some like that which is kind of funny because I think Lisa mentions like what type of, like when the guy that assaults her in the movie uh, he was like, so what type of, what, who's your favorite director in film? And she's like, oh, he directs silent films. And I was like, oh, that's a nice little touch because, you know, she starts to like, you know, talk to a guy who was basically mute throughout the entire film, <laughs> which was like, oh, that's a, that's a nice small detail to show that why she was, uh, already because it it does show like those few little lines where you show what lisa's likes are in the movie in the beginning when she's like drugged out of her mind you start to see why she immediately befriends the creature in the movie even though she doesn't realize it's the guy that she's been hanging out with the entire time i was like oh that's pretty cool <laughs> Oh, I like that. I like that detail. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, I like that also she doesn't like fall for him immediately. Which also the weird thing is that shocks me is that this dude who's been dead and buried in the ground has listened to Lisa this whole time. Like, her talking, her rambling at the graveyard. I was like, wow, he was dead and he heard that? And it makes you think, like, well, shit, then that means he was conscious. So, wait, that means, like, was he, was he fucking conscious this whole time hearing her talk? So, that means while he was dead and buried, he was fucking like <laughs> like conscious throughout the whole decades of his life uh where he is like well I'm I'm dead and buried under the ground and I've been suffering through it that's that kind of makes you think like oh god what if that happens when you die you're conscious with all of it like if I'm buried in the ground I don't feel pain. Eh. <laughs> I can sleep a few years and then you just get resurrected and you're like, Oh! I walk again! Holy shit! <laughs> That's the weird thing about this movie is that it skips a bunch of tropes, which is crazy to say that. The, I mean, it still does the tropes, but I think what I like is Lisa Frankenstein does the tropes differently not try to shot by shot try to be like remember this happened in the 80s that that they did this kind of movie or anything it's like no it's like we'll do our own thing like what would typically be shown when you see like light being strike down into a graveyard you would see the grave that the dead body's in come out the ground or get struck by lightning and you see it no it's on a TV screen <laughs> and it's in like a when Lisa surprisingly she like oh wait she did say that the shortcut to the party was where the cemetery was so of course she ran there uh, without problem but yeah never mind <laughs> what I just said there she just ran into the cemetery like like depressed sad hated the party yeah fuck you sister wherever you were not supporting her like damn uh and 
then the green lightning is shown like the clouds are forming you see this green like lightning striking the clouds and you don't see the actual resurrection part happen and i was like huh i feel like we missed a scene there but i was like kind of appreciative of that it was like no let's do this quick let's do this let's get to the uh wacky antics of this corpse immediately <laughs> and i do like the bond it's like the slow bond between lisa and the creature that I like like she doesn't fall for her immediately because again she is crushing on the guy that uh is in her school that doesn't want to give her the time and day and you see them slowly connecting more N not from the killings but more like the kind acts of gesture that lisa does for him and what the creature does for her like you know like hey you should totally dress in this kind of outfit and hey you should totally do this to help me and then you see them interacting more with each other i did like that it slowly builds up the relationship most films like this like most films are a premise like this today in the modern day would just been like oh how many jokes can we cram in in this movie oh how many humor how much humor we can put in this movie oh what can we uh oh what jokes can we fish out that's popular that's topical or something like a movie like this if it was written by anyone else if it was directed by anyone else who was like thinking i want to do a comedy that felt like the 80s comedies back then what would they do that zelda williams and diablo cody has done better those guys would have just again yeah crammed a bunch of jokes make a bunch of 80s references that are basically like again like the south park member berries it's like remember the 80s remember this remember david Bowie? remember queen remember all the 80s movies like back to the future that came out that year remember ferris bueller's day off like they would do that they would do that they just said no let's do what those kids in the 80s or what directors or writers would have thought of in the 80s that they were obsessed with and they do that you know just like george lucas he was uh, he took inspiration of Star Wars from old movie serials back in the day, like Flash, like Flash Gordon. Um, so much so that there is a Flash Gordon adaptation in the 80s that was based on the old movie serials. And then there are people like, who else? Like, <laughs> I'm trying to remember who else that were inspired. There are people who were inspired by old black and white movies and they were like thinking, oh man, what if we put them in an 80s setting? Or like, well, not an 80s setting. Back then, they would say, well, we put them in a modern setting. This movie had the thought process of, like, what an 80s movie director and writer would do. They would take something from the past that they grew up watching or liked. And what are the topical things that you think, like, oh, what would a teenager in the 80s would do or in this case what would a teenager back in that day would do or like with their current like setting and then they would say like what will you obsess with there's black and white movies old horror films those 70s horror films mainly like you know dawn of the dead which oh she no not, it wasn't dawn of the dead she was watching on tv i think it was day of the dead because that was because the creature I saw, the zombie I saw in that movie, I think it was Day of the Dead. Because that was the one where they were trying to keep, bring the zombies back into being, um, uh, to be human, to be a law-abiding citizen of society, I think. I think it was that one. It looked like it. Which is crazy because I think that was the way that they were trying to set up, like, hey, we could... We can change this creature to be better and make him human again. Basically, the whole message of like the whole 
premise of the movie making the creature human again which you see slowly him becoming more human and less dead which i thought was a nice little detail oh especially i loved what also felt tim burton kind of is like the intro sequence where we see the creature's life when he was still alive and i felt like if this was tim burton that would have been in stop motion <laughs> and no really it would have been in stop motion if it was tim burton like this whole intro sequence i loved because it was like a small like short animated film of this person's life and you see what happened to him you see what uh he's going through and i did like that you learn more about the creature in that opening shot i did like that it is something 80s like to do where you show like oh let's talk about this character and what happened to them back in the day before we go to the setting in the present day i do like that it's something that's usually glossed over a lot in modern like i would say mid-budget movies would do where they say no let's get straight to the action let's get straight to the comedy this movie takes its time but also doesn't take its time at the same time and i did like that a lot about this movie it was a new it had a middle ground on what they wanted the pacing to be and i like that and at the end of the movie feels like a john waters film <laughs> which i will spoil now because all the girls just seem like assholes kind of mean girls like kind of heathers basically uh and <laughs> this and, and if you're wondering how the crush dies uh the creature cuts his dick off and <laughs> And then it gets sewn onto him, <laughs> which I was like not expecting at all. It just becomes batshit insane at the end of the movie. And the funny thing is, this movie could have easily done something that, again, what most eighty, what most movies would do like this. Oh, it's a Frankenstein movie. Of course you gotta have an ending sequence when something's on fire and there's an angry mob about to uh, attack the creature. They don't do that. They end with the fire, but not the angry mob. And I thought, cause again, I was thinking Edward Scissorhands a lot when I was, when I was watching this, cause I was thinking, oh, is there gonna be people pillaging and going after her to kill her? no it's just like she was like well might as well let myself die and this angry mob will never form like the whole murder thing just doesn't become big public news on who did it it was just oh we now know who it is it was just it was kept closed in the between a few people and it, 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 I was like so surprised about that. I was like thinking when it came to the part where she killed herself and at the end of the movie, I was like, oh, we're done already? And it does like that uh, cartoony kind of like uh, circle thing where it closes and it goes to black <laughs> at the end. I was like, wow that was <laughs> that was we were already at the ending and luckily it wasn't those endings that were like we just stop we just stop somewhere and we're like whatever goodbye it was more like <laughs> again like 80s it's like it just was like a movie like again in modern day would just be like let's end the whole movie when the whole climax has stopped 
and then the character has already got already done whatever he needs to do and then just leaves you don't know what happens to them after you don't know if everyone is doing fine you just ends it just ends and but this movie was like fade to black and let's see what happened to them now lisa's dead and <laughs> the sister who knows everything that fucking transpired <laughs> doesn't say anything they supposedly mourn the loss of her death I don't know I can't tell with that dad <laughs> um, and then it ends with the creature finally being to speak and Lisa is alive again but now she looks dead like him which is funny how they look <laughs> which again another <laughs> I know I'm comparing more with Tim Burton thing I just love like how Tim Burton designs his characters are always big eyed and look like they have insomnia. <laughs> and what I haven't noticed, well, I'm, I'm noticing it now when I'm, think, when I'm looking back at it, is that, you know, Cole Sprouse's character, he had like kind of like that shadowy black um, ring around his eyes, the smoky like shadow of it. Kind of like, again, and the way he's like, I think it's the lighting and the makeup, the way he's like lighted, if you see him like pale or, you know, looking dead, felt like, oh, this is what Tim Burton would do also with how to make the character look pale or dead. And it felt very akin to it. It felt, had that ask of it. And he's still... Tim Burton still does that. I mean, he did it with Dark Shadows. I think he did it with Doomsday as well, sort of. I think I wished Jenna Ortega kind of had that lean towards it of the whole, like, I don't know, gothic aesthetic where it is. But then again, she naturally does it well already in the show. But I did like that this felt like a hearkening back to, like, make them really pale. <laughs> basically when <laughs> make them look dead make them look like they were uh, a corpse i thought it looks goofy it looks over the top but hey that's the best part about this movie it leans on to being over the top it leans on to being comedic and funny it leads on it leans into it more most movies would be like, let's balance it to be goofy, but also serious. No, this movie is like, no, we're going way over the top with this movie. We're going to be just batshit insane goofy, and, <laughs> and we're going to embrace it. And Zelda Williams does amazing with this. Like, anyone could have taken Diablo Cody's script and be like, man let's make it serious but also comedic in a way and <laughs> and they could have messed it up uh and make it just a basic movie like someone could have taken that script rewrote re it to have more humor more jokes but no this felt very passionate very uh uh what can i say what can i say very um uh, uh i guess natural like it doesn't feel like the studio uh intervened when they were making this movie i mean i don't know if the original idea was supposed to be pg-13 or what but i was expecting this movie to be rated r but it didn't matter. Like the movie was still good regardless. And I can tell you this, this is a perfect Valentine's Day date movie to go and take uh, a loved one to to watch this film. Definitely not Madame Webb, that's for sure. <laughs> um, and just have a good time with it. It might not be everyone's cup of tea. I think a few younger 
audience members that are probably younger than me um probably teens i don't think they're gonna like the film that much i don't know oh they might they might like it but i feel the crowd that i see a movie like in this gen z millennial <laughs> they would definitely like it <laughs> uh i say they would have a good time with this film uh most definitely uh and hopefully this would if this does start a cult following which i can tell you i'm already going to be part of that cult already <laughs> um i hope it does garner more attention from people because this movie might bomb at the box office might i don't know might not do good numbers but hopefully the critics aren't gonna sway your opinion and say that oh movie's bad well i guess we can just skip it no just go and watch it go see it go have a good time it's worth your money uh to go and see that film i would give it 9.7 out of 10. I know that there was a few things I was, I think I said that it is a bit like everything goes about really fast. I guess I wanted it to be a bit longer, but the amount of time we got in this movie, I say it did well with its runtime. I say it did good with its runtime, uh, building the relationship between Lisa and the creature and uh and completing lisa's arc into a satisfying ending i do like that i hope i said much as i said about this movie about being a love layer to the 80s i hope i said all my piece especially with my rants <laughs> i don't know if i said it in a perfect cohesive way but i try to uh <laughs> um while we're at it if we want to make a sweet hour long mark on this movie, let's talk about, oh, let me say something else about a movie, actually, before we get to the other one I watched uh, that I should have reviewed a long time ago. Um, there is a movie that I reviewed back in 2018 or 2017, I believe. Um, called uh, Summer of 84. I don't know if anyone has seen it or anyone has talked about it. I would say that's another movie that feels like a lost 80s movie as well. Uh, the way it's shot, the way it's acted, the way it's portrayed. But let me say like, it feels like a lost 80s movie with a dark twist to it. <laughs> If I uh, if if that makes sense, Summer of '84 is a horror movie about these group of kids who find out that their that their neighbor is potentially a serial killer that's been murdering uh, families and children. And that movie, I don't want to spoil it in case you guys never seen it. This was a Canadian, uh, movie. Uh, this movie I reviewed. A while because I I discovered it while I was searching horror movies that came out recently on digital, and this was when Rooster Teeth had their horror movie out, and then there was another horror movie that came out also that had the same premise. <laughs> Weirdly enough, um, and while I was searching for that Rooster Teeth horror movie, uh. I saw there was another whole movie that dropped also called Summer of 84, and I watched that, and I liked that movie more than that Rooster Teeth horror film, but that movie felt like an 80s movie. There was not a lot of, like, references to, like, 80s stuff, like, remember this, remember that. I think there were a few here and there, but I don't know. But it is taking place mainly in this suburban neighborhood and they were trying to figure out if their neighbor was a serial killer or not kind of like akin to like i guess fright night where 
that movie you're trying to figure out is my neighbor a vampire or am I going crazy <laughs> kind of thing and they're trying to figure out if their neighbor is a killer if he's a psychopath and or it's just paranoia and I like that movie does give you the mystery of wondering are they or are they not and then the movie typical fashion it was like surprise he was a killer and then the cops will go after him and arrest him same thing but there's a dark twist at the end of the movie that I liked because if all the movie goes through the motions of tropes that you would see in this type of 80s film and then it just makes you lean into the comfort of that and just be like everything's fine everything's okay i'm sure everything's gonna turn out well in this movie but spoiler alert it doesn't i'm not gonna say why it doesn't have a positive ending i'm gonna say to you this it just gets dark it gets dark at the end of the movie and it puts that fear into your head because you're like well shit this could happen to me in real life if that ever happened to me kind of situation and summer of 84 does when i was watching lisa frankenstein i started thinking about was there ever a modern movie that portrayed the 80s better and it's not just member berries and then that movie came to mind also summer of 84 i don't know <laughs> if that movie is like i don't know if that movie's in any streaming platform maybe it's on shutter probably but if you have a chance to see that movie go see summer of 84 it's pretty good you're going to be surprised that the dark twist of that movie is going to be like, okay, I can't sleep anymore. <laughs> um, if you are still craving an itch for something like Lisa Frankenstein, and if you haven't seen any other 80s movies like this, uh, Monster Squad. <laughs> Monster Squad, or Weird Science, or something else, I don't know. <laughs> something that, I'm trying to think of a similar vibe with this movie. It, I'm, give me a mo moment, I, it might come to me, probably won't in this video. <laughs> that I can think of, that's good. But anyway, let's talk about a movie that I was kind of worried about, but after seeing it, I liked it fine. Uh, and that is Wonka. Wonka is a prequel to, obviously, the Gene Wilder Willy Wonka movie, um, not the Johnny Depp one. And I did like the Charlie and Chocolate Factory movie when I was a kid. I knew all the lyrics to the songs in that movie. I watched that movie five times in the movie theater and about 13 or 14 times on DVD. <laughs> when I was a kid, but when I started to see Gene Wilder's uh, performance as Willy Wonka, I liked that movie more than the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory one. As much as people would say, oh, the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory one was great, yeah, I still think that movie's good too, but I have a more softer spot for the Gene Wilder one than the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory one. I'm not saying it's a bad movie. I, I do like that film too. I like those films equally. Just one much more than the other. <laughs> um, and I was like nervous when uh, this movie was announced. But knowing that the writers and director of Paddington, of both of the Paddington movies, was going to make this film... I was actually a bit more like at ease when I heard they were going to make the film. I was like, okay, good. And Timothy Chalamet was going to be Wonka. And I was like, oh, I hope he does a good job. I hope he's not bad. I hope he's not 
gonna be Emma Watson with the whole singing. Kinda was, but I think that's mostly him. I can hear a bit of autotune on his voice, but not as awful as Emma Watson's from Beauty and the Beast. God, that was terrible. Timmy Chalamet seems like he is singing on his own. Like he actually committed and actually learned to sing. So I I actually was glad about that because the songs are catchy in this movie and the acting is great. I think I do believe Shama, Timothy Chalamet as a younger Willy Wonka. I did I actually did buy that he, that's like, yeah, I could see that. This wide-eyed boy wanting to make chocolate is him. Uh, I don't have much to say about it, but it is a nice feel-good musical movie. I like the performances. Hugh Grant as an Oompa Loompa I thought was great. Um, I did like the villains in the movie as well. They were just ridiculous, especially Keegan Michael Key's character being a corrupt police officer that would definitely... Uh, break the law just for chocolate and i do love the running gag where he gets fatter and fatter in each scene he's in <laughs> um and <laughs> i like the visuals i like the look of the film it's very colorful i'm like i was like color oh my god i'm just like happy about that i like color in this movie it's it's a Warner Brothers movie that isn't piss or puke green. Thank the Lord, <laughs> or dark, very dark and gloomy. I just love it. it was a more positive and uh, happy looking environment of a film. I did like that. Um, I don't have much to say about it. I say I was fairly. Um, uh, amazed and impressed that this movie was actually pretty good because no one has made a Wonka movie since the 2000s so I was like really coming in with high expectations that movie was going to be good and they have made my expectations great and I was like glad and yeah I say that movie is a solid 8 out of 10 for me because I kind of had like problems wondering well wait a minute I could see why he became the chocolate maker he is now I mean the uh, like in the old movie but I was like trying to wonder what about that darker side of him that would make a tunnel of a chicken's head getting cut off and making everyone on that boat scared for their lives. <laughs> like, what? when did he became that? I mean, there is the technical, there is the other side of him that you would see as it goes along with the movie, the more positive and actually a kind person he is. But what about that other side of him that we don't see much of? <laughs> uh, hopefully we get to see like if there is a sequel to this movie i wouldn't be opposed to it if it's written well um but yeah i say 8 out of 10 it's a good movie i loved it i had a fun time seeing it i kind of wish i saw it in the theater because i would have loved to hear that music around the surround stereo of the theater than my his poor quality of speakers <laughs> but yeah i liked it fine uh i think that was it for movies that i've seen that were new uh recently i believe i think oh yeah wait i saw aquaman <laughs> before we talk <laughs> before i <laughs> leave that's right I saw the final DCEU film and it was not good. <laughs> it fell out of, if you want my opinion about how many movies were butchered during the last few movies of the, of the DCEU, I will tell you this, the one 
movie, out of Shazam, Theory of the Gods, out of The Flash, I will tell you this. Aquaman got the freaking shaft out of anyone. I, rem I heard they cut out so much stuff in this movie. They cut out Batman's, like, they cut out Ben Affleck's Batman's uh, scenes in that film. Uh, they cut out a lot of things, I believe. They cut out Amber Heard stuff, I believe, too. She's still in the movie, but you can tell that half of her dialogue was probably cut because she's got so few little lines in that movie. It's either lines about the plot of the movie, like, oh, there's a problem with the council, we gotta go, or our baby was kidnapped, we gotta save them, or that's it. She has little lines in this movie. She is barely speaking in that film. It is crazy, because after the whole, you know, trial, it's like, we gotta chop down half of her lines in this movie and you can tell because the movie's like what a uh, minus the credits it's an hour and 50 minute long movie maybe less than that because my god there was so much stuff you can obviously tell was probably reshot or freaking cut from the film it cut the shaft of it. It's barely a movie. It's a movie with shit happening. That's it. The whole movie is just stuff happening. It's just, oh, stuff is happening in the film. Aquaman is uh, fighting this guy. Now he's fighting that guy. Now he's fighting this guy. Now he's breaking this person now. Now he's beating the shit out of this guy. He got beaten himself. Oh, now he has to do this. Now he has to go here. Now he has to go there. It's just Aquaman just gets to point A to point B. The movie. That's all it is. It's Aquaman going to point A, point B, and then whatever other journey he has to go to as well. That's the film. It's just do this objective. Okay, now do this objective. Gotcha. Now do this objective. It's like, what's happening? It just felt blah. And you would think that we would get more of like Aquaman stuff in this movie. Like, more of him being underwater and more of underwater fight scenes? You don't. Especially doesn't help that he's wearing the same Jason Momoa attire that Jason Momoa always wears in his films a lot. It's like it doesn't help at all. It just feels blah. This movie got the full-on shaft. The Flash, it had problems, but at least it tried to at least do its story. Freaking Batgirl, yeah, it got shut down. It got kicked out of the curb. Yeah, that one did get the worst of it. But to release Aquaman in theaters in that quality, it was just garbage. At that point, why release it in the theater? At this point, don't bother. Just release it on HBO Max and then call it a day. Why put the effort to just bring this movie out? You didn't put that much effort into it when it was freaking Batgirl. You just said, nah, fuck Batgirl. Kick her out. Just, wow. Pretty fucked. At that point. It's just... Not a good movie. There's nothing to keep your interest. It's just stuff happening the movie. And maybe you'll get an Aquaman movie out of it. It's not good. 
it's not good. It's not like the first Aquaman movie. The first Aquaman movie it at least felt like a film. At least felt like there was a beginning, middle, and end arc. This movie just felt like constant noise. <laughs> Makes a Michael Bay movie look like Citizen Kane compared to that. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> It's not good. It gets a th- it gets a three out of ten for me. A solid three out of ten for me. It's not that great. <laughs> it's not great. We had we had a bad time with this one. And not only that, how to say fuck you to the DC fans out there? The movie, the DCU ends. With Orm eating a cockroach. Oh, and there's the topper. Eating a cockroach in a burger. Because he thinks cockroaches are delectable. Ugh. That's how the DCU franchise ends. Not with a... Not with, with glorious purpose. Not with a fucking... Loud, boisterous, uh, blaze of glory. A whimper. And a cockroach. Bad. (laughs) Terrible. (laughs) But anyway, yes, that was it for my reviews of newer movies that I saw over, I guess, the past few months now. Like December, January, and oh shit, and now February. So, anyway, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you back in the next one. Ciao, darlings. Remember, you are loved. Ow, 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 ow.